Good evening and welcome to another edition of This Week in 60 Minutes. I'm Rudy Baldwin. And I am Juan Angel Jr. I want to say a special welcome to all of those that are joining our program for the very first time this evening. Good evening, I'm Nalini Singh and tonight we'll be updating you on what's happening in GCOM. Continue our discussions on the AP and new AFC field promises that you're trying to package as your promise delivered. And then we will tell you about the PPP's plan for prosperity. Okay, so to get right into it, uh, the latest to come out of GCOM, and yesterday was the um, statutory meeting uh, of the commission. Yeah. Yes. So there were concerns among the population and others that funding is not available for the elections. However, it is now confirmed from the GCOM commission that all funds are available for elections to be held yes. on the 2nd of March 2020. Um, however, we've kind of hit a snag as it relates to the ID cards. As you are aware, there were some 18, over 18,000 persons named that was published with an yes. order from the CEO of um, GCOM, mm -hmm. Mr. Keith, Keith Lowenfield, uh, directing them to come and uplift their ID card. Failure to do so would result in their name being removed from the official list of electors. However, the name would have remained on the National Register of Registrants. Um, however, the chairman said that she would have also created a supplemental OLE and allow those persons to vote if they show up at polling stations on elections day. However, that, uh, that, that position is now being contested um, within the commission itself yeah. and um, there is no clear directions as it results to what will happen there. Um, in fact, we have heard reports oh. that there's an extension Oh, oh, that yeah. would be granted yeah, to these persons. Alexander person. was just saying that only 800 persons picked up their ID cards. Yes, the latest news is uh, 802 persons yeah. thus yeah. far of the 18 plus thousands yes. um, that have their ID cards there. Also, as it relates to the house to house um, registration exercise, the data garnered from that exercise, which was abandoned, mm -hmm. um, there is yet to be any decision made as it relates to that. Um, as you know, GCOM has indicated that they sent all 370 plus thousands uh, persons that would have registered to be cross-matched mm -hmm. against the National Register of Registrants. 60 plus thousand came back as new registrants, or ideally which would have been new registrants, meaning, the, to be new, yeah, yeah. meaning their fingerprints did not match with those in the NRR. However, upon um, their own internal investigation, the Secretariat has found that some 17,000 uh, 17, plus of those 60,000 are actually on the NRR. So there are problems there as well. And that is one of the reasons that the People's Progressive Party has been advocating that this data should not be used because it's flawed. Um, the parties did not, all the political parties did not participate in the yeah. exercise which is mandated. Scrutinized. Yes, it wasn't yeah. properly scrutinized. <laughs> they can see from their own looking at it is that mm -hmm. some of these people might be reappearing and the amount of time it would take to find them and then verify which is your mm -hmm. and all of that would take too long. Exactly. Or running out of time. Um, as it relates to foreign observer thus far, the OAS, the Commonwealth, the Carter Center and the European Union has been accredited as yes. well by the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So those four agencies, among others, will be here observing the elections. In fact, most of these agencies are already here doing ground work, That's helping at yes. GCOM. So, um, we have foreign people working at GCOM now too. Mm -hmm. The Canadians uh, offer their help yes, and, and I think advisors. Banner is here too now. Well, yeah. he comes and goes. Yes, to exactly. Help with the commissioner. And um, however, the local agencies that has applied, GCOM is yet to accredit them because, uh, and GCOM said once the the government accredits the foreign observers, they will take the necessary steps to, to accredit local. the the, the local, local um, which parties, which, which would have um, applied to be observers. So we have the local private sector, the Chamber of Commerce, AmCham, and the GTUC, which have all applied and signaled their intentions to observe the elections. So we hope that GCOM move in a yeah, very sure, fast sure manner, manner to mm -hmm. get this done. Of course, nomination day has been confirmed. It is now uh, the 10th of January 2020 mm -hmm. would be nominations day. So uh, that is something to look forward to. Okay. Uh, that is all we have uh, currently from GCOM to update you guys on. Yeah. Uh. 
I think one of the most comforting facts to come out of that GCOM meeting was the fact that they have the funds available. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Both, both sides of the commission said so, Gunraj mm -hmm. and Alexander. Yeah, said. because we were actually hearing before that, uh, well, mm -hmm. from rumors or whispers well, that you know, the commission pro doesn't have enough money to pull off mm -hmm. the election. Which we but always knew was just... <laughs> as but they're saying rumors. that's why they're not dissolving parliament, yeah. in, in case in they need the funds. In fact, exactly, they were trying to get the PPP mm -hmm. back to parliament by saying mm -hmm. that, you know, GCOM might need money, but the excuse is out the door. And yeah. We do need at this point in time for Parliament to be dissolved exactly. and for us to go ahead as, yeah. as Rudy as you pointed out we also have the date for nomination. the nominations mm -hmm. and let's get the elections rolling let's get let's get on with it well as we understand it um, the, according to the Constitution uh, the Parliament must be uh, dissolved within three months of yes. an election so uh, they have until they January have 10th yes, um, to get that done yes, do. so we hope they do that speedily um, as Nalini pointed out, we'll continue to look at the AP and UFC's um, regions and failed promises and what they claim as their uh, success and promise delivered. And we start tonight by looking at Region 4. The very first one under the heading, Growing Our Economy and Creating Jobs, mm -hmm. would be new leases for land given to farmers to cultivate the land in Mahaika Barbies area. Now, this is very hilarious that they would list something like this mm -hmm. because I'm sure everyone is aware by now that what they're speaking of here is where they revoke the lease of ordinary citizens, ordinary farmers, uh, even some of their own supporters. We have. Uh, hundreds of persons from number 41 village and other places in region 5 whose leases was revoked and then they came to the PPP for help we had to take those matters to court we end up winning those matters they're back on the land working now and of course um, they were only giving it to a few friends and cronies of the AP and UFC to work the lands so that is a total falsehood it did not happen, and if you speak with anyone in Region 5, rice farmers, cattle um, rears, or anyone that is engaged in farming and uh, the qualification of land, they will tell you that that is actually the reality, that the government threatened uh, to take away the land, which they then did revoke their leases and give it to a few PNC supporters and friends of the party. I think what's interesting to note though is those people mm -hmm. were actually their supporters. Mm, exactly. Well, were. <laughs> were, exactly. Mm -hmm. Anyways, moving on in the same growing our economy and creating jobs, the Small Business Bureau <coughs> extends loans to think. This is a PP program that they just kind of continued. Mm -hmm. So then in Region 5, they continue to say, building better infrastructure. This one's one of my favorite ones. Mm -hmm. Investing $460 million to repair CD defense after severe damage. The severe damage that they refer to is the lands that were flooded from Danzig to Fairfield. The REO a year before was informed of this and he had a large press conference where he said this was fear mongering and they're lying and uh, you know. Mm -hmm. What we need to point out is now this land that this the whole area that was flooded is rice land. Rice is not a salt friendly thing it cannot grow in salt water so now it's either the farmers wait years or do an expensive process called liming to get rid of all that salt mm -hmm. from the land so they can then grow rice again anyways we're moving on in region five improving <laughs> education sector they basically just talk about re uh, doing projects that um we're on in the in the like you like to say the pipelines coming down, okay, yes. the construction of a new hope facility and so on. Then the providing of the world class health care. This always amuses me because you find places not having Panadol, not having drugs for the people. Basic, basic drugs. Basic, mm -hmm. very basic drugs. Then fighting crime is one of those things where they talk about uh, the police are working on tackling criminal networks and bandits that are plaguing the community and their emergency systems. But they always say that. Crime is a... And in fact, um, crime has been on the rise in Region 5 and Region 6 because yes. if you look at the newspaper, yeah. most of the persons, business uh, persons in those two regions are heavily affected as it relates to crime. In fact, I saw a story just recently where um, two days after being robbed, a business man and his wife has been waiting for a response from the police yeah. in, within that region. Yeah, you were just saying that too. Okay, cleaning mm -hmm. up our town is the new well was activated at the cotton tree treatment plant. This, this, this plant was provided on a PP and these things were all things being done. So this is one of those things where they are repackaging, or I like to say painted green and calling it their own. So then we move on to Region 6. Yeah, we, we, we can talk about the, the promises delivered and the package that they have here, the first heading, uh, as, as well as with Region 5, is that they said that they, they grew the economy and they created jobs in mm -hmm. this region. Mm -hmm. Well, 
any Guyanese would know that in Region 6 specifically, uh, there are thousands of people who would have been fired from their jobs. Um, yeah. There's 7,000 sugar workers, we know that they closed the estate. Mm -hmm. And that has impacted directly, as I mentioned, 7,000 people, but indirectly about 4,000 other people. Um, well, they said that they established a business registration hub to make it easier to register businesses. And uh, they, they also established the Belvedere Industrial Development Project. Which was which established? It, yes, which was established before. <laughs> but they feel it still hasn't been completed. That's under correct. Them, they took over the project as it was happening. Yes, and so it's, still not, there. it's still not completed. And, you know, <coughs> basically some of the things that they've been saying that they did in, uh, in Region 6 is that they, they trained, they, they, sorry, they created opportunities for guys to go workers. Uh, the fact of the matter is that no substantive report has been given, substantive support, sorry, has been given to the 7,000 plus sugar workers who were fired by the APNU AFC coalition government. And, you know, the government's unwillingness to support the sack sugar workers have been evidence in the fact that the government broke the law and did not pay the, the workers their full severance. You know, and it was also seen again when government refused to say it was informing the sack sugar workers that millions were available under the Sustainable Livelihood and Entrepreneurial Development Program. Uh, these are just some of the things that, that we see here and the fictions that the government is trying to tell people that you know they created so many opportunities in Region 6 and everything is bright, everyone has jobs, but the reality uh, is, is quite, quite, quite different. I think there is a different region. region 6 than you and I. Th that's correct. It's probably a completely different, <laughs> different Region 6 than we are made to believe. Um, they've also said here that they reduced the, uh, the dependence uh, the sugar industry's de dependence on the national coffers. The fact of the matter is that the sugar industry's dependence on the national coffers has not been reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the national treasury is exposed with the borrowing of $30 billion. Exactly. And we know about yeah. this. The, yeah. the, the bond study, that they, the bond that they mm -hmm. did. Yeah. And it's issued at the interest of actually 4.75%. Exactly. <laughs> Since the borrowing um, by well, this And all they've this. done with this money is thus far is just to rehabilitate the sports lounge at yeah. um, LBI. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's all it. we're hearing. Yeah. Nothing else. We don't know where Nothing the money is the or what's happening. Mm -hmm. When they looked at the plan of closing it, is they didn't think of the socioeconomics. They just looked at one number. That's correct. And we know, we've been, we continue to repeat that they went against their own their own commission They're of inquiry, yeah, exactly. yes, recommendations of the inquiry, mm -hmm. which, which no says closure. do not close the industry, mm -hmm. but they still went ahead and, and did this. And, you know, they're saying now that there's also a diversification plan that they had in place, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is that there has been no efforts in direction of diversification. Mm -hmm. uh, while government said it had, this is what they're saying, they right-sized uh, the sugar industry, <laughs> all it did was actually close down the major sugar estates, mm -hmm. leaving thousands of sugar workers on the breadline in the worst mass firing in Guyana's history, I would say. Exactly. Yeah, and you know, they really have no direction for these those people. If you go to areas like Rose Hall yes. and things, those communities used to be like vibrant communities and now they're very depressed because the sugar worker would have some money, he'd go buy bread from the shop and then she in turn would use a taxi service and that's how money flows in an economy. Yes, but so I guess basically economics we were, is not your strong Yes, point. we were talking about it, Nalini, and uh, <coughs> some people might just want to look at the revenue factor when it comes to, to this industry, but we really have to look beyond this. We have mm -hmm. to look at how this has impacted the social well-being of these communities mm -hmm. and how families have really been impacted. You know, I saw that uh, in Region 6, uh, I think that this was earlier this year, the, uh, you know, the, the I think it was the RDC was having a meeting mm -hmm. and they made certain recommendations for the RU to tell to tell the government that they needed certain monies to provide transportation for the for the children of the sack sugar workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, they were refusing to, to carry this forward. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, the ideas that this government has and the feelings that, and the actions that they show towards, you know, the, the sugar workers is really that they don't care and they don't want to assist in any way. You know? mm -hmm. So you fire them on one hand and you're not providing another avenue to assist on another well, hand. I think it's quite providing. unfortunate. Yes. Um, <laughs> in fact, um, I think Harman, uh, the f director general, said it the best. Where um, He's quoted in the press saying yes. that um, and to repeat it as if it's something new when you are really warming up food that has been there already and putting it out <laughs> to the nation as if this is your thing, it is wrong. They're, they're taking this thing already cooked, put it in a microwave, warm it up, and serve it as if it's their own. All of these things, 
that they have here is really an attempt to hoodwink the Guyanese people. And that is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about these these um, failed promise, these promise delivered that the coalition government. Uh, over the past week, we've been pointing out to you that most of these things that they have here are already cooked food, to put it as Mr. Harmon would say, and they're just reheating it and packaging it as all oh, the coalition government or is doing so well. some of it's so just well. make-believe food. Uh, exactly, and some <laughs> of it is just made up. And not even in the pipelines and some of the work. And we'll get to that a bit later on, on yeah, those okay. um, <coughs> things. But I think the president is so aloof from reality as well. Um, in the December 4th interview which he had with Newsroom, yeah. he said that, and he was questioned about um, you know the campaign and if your promise can withstand, mm -hmm. um, if your promise delivered that we're, we've been scrutinizing here can withstand the people. And he said that, um, I think our, our record has been good enough to convince them speaking about the populace, mm -hmm. that we deserve a, a second term to complete the work we've embarked upon mm -hmm. in May 2015. But really and truly, the work that they've done is just a continuation of what the PP, People's Progressive Party would have left. Uh, if you look at all the major infrastructure projects that are going on right now, the East Coast Road, that's a PP project. The Sheriff Street Mandela upgrade, that's a PP project. The West Coast Road, which was completed under them, that's a PP project. The opening of Movie Town, another PP project. They just went in and they snip a ribbon and claim it as their own. And that's exactly what Mr. Harmon is talking about taking already cooked food and repackaging it yeah. and trying to force people and tell them that, oh, look at the coalition government and we're doing so excellent, which is a total lie. I think one of my favorite things they repackaged food, though, is the airport. Okay. Because mm -hmm. in okay. when they were in opposition, they were like, this is too expensive. Doo -doo -doo. And when they got to government, they were like, oh, no, we didn't know better. And the price went, I remember your yeah. um, Bishop Agile going over this yeah. being like, <laughs> This is what That's we were going to get at this price, and then yeah. they got less for more money. Yeah. That's Anyways. correct, and we know now that the toilets are not even working at the at the airport. Yeah. And, you know that that's a big it's a big joke all yes. over the place. Yeah. You know, a person exactly. saying you have to take your own toilet when you're going to the airport now, <laughs> and all kind of story. Yeah. This government is a national embarrassment to this yeah, country. We, we basically yes. were spending money for a new airport, and now we're getting mm -hmm. a not even a renovated. This is like a slam dash kind of kind of airport. This is not even food hitting in the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. So, Continuing on their record in Region 6, uh, the building of better infrastructure, most of the things they, are co they put down on the hair were projects under the PP, like uh, the ramps at Oriella and the dirt roads and all yeah. of those, uh, when it comes to improving um, our education. Yeah. Those were once again. Of course. Well, we know that they took away the $10,000 cash grant yeah. from, from, from the kids in this community. And I have to say again uh, that, you know, in this community where you have thousands of people who are unemployed now and they're struggling to get monies in their pockets, struggling to carry their kids to, their kids to school and so on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they completely wiped away the $10,000 cash grant. So they really did not improve the education system. As a matter of fact, it's, it's been very strenuous. I have actually spoken to... I would say dozens of uh, of parents, dozens of young people uh, in this region, and you know the the stories that you hear. It's really, really unfortunate that they don't even have monies when the day come to go certain places, and and this is what you know they're faced with at this time. You know, basically saying that you're 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 extending this and constructing that, but you know you're really not investing in the educational in the educational system in our country. You're not, you're not really giving them the tools that they need to build themselves up, I would say. So some of the things that they're claiming to construct, like the hostel at mm -hmm. Springlands, have been there for years. Yes. So they're really repackaging mm -hmm. things Once and claiming again, it their yes. own. And then they talk about providing world-class health care and they can't find basic drugs. Basically, and you know, we still don't have the specialty hospital. Yes. I have, to, I have to talk uh, about that's it. Your you know, because as you said before, we've been mentioning it. You know, you're going to bring in all these new equipment, and we don't even have basic drugs. You know, your procurement practices are all over the place. And you know, if we get into procurement in this region and how the government has and the REO mm -hmm. <laughs> have been procuring drugs, you know, and they've been breaking so many procurement practices. You know, it would take us helped. all night to talk about this. Mm -hmm. But you know, the region. Uh, does not have basic basic supplies, basic ba mm -hmm. basic health supplies, and basic drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we can't we can't really boast about a, a vibrant and world class health system if we don't have basic supplies for our people in the region. 
Exactly. You know, that, that's the bottom line. We really can't go ahead with, with saying anything is new and anything is innovative if we can't even provide the minimum for our people at these, at these hospitals, I would yeah, say. Yeah, because having all the equipment and nothing to treat them with is yeah. pointless. It is you'll pointless. be like, okay, you're diagnosed with this. You need this, but we don't have it. Good luck. You know, one, one thing that they're saying here also is, is fighting crime yeah, that's and, and protecting the citizens. As Rudy, as you pointed out, crime is one uh, is rampant mm -hmm. in Region 5 and 6 right now. You mm -hmm. know, gun crimes and robberies, you know, it is so every single day we're seeing that something is going on in these regions. And, you know, the minister just seems as if he is aloof. He doesn't understand what's going on. It's as if he doesn't realize that crime is happening in these areas. You know, and they're, they're refusing to admit that there is a crime situation. Mm -hmm. So they, they've actually said here in their in their record that they've ended piracy <laughs> that plagued the yeah. quarantine coast. Oh, wow. our, fishes, our fishermen were under constant attack threatening their lives and livelihood. Mm -hmm. You know, but the fact of the matter is that just several months ago, there was a piracy attack that led to several deaths of our local fishermen. Mm -hmm. You know, and the bodies of these fishermen, some of them are still, still, are still to be found. Yeah. So, when we look at this record, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's as if they are expecting Guyanese to read this and really believe what they're what they're saying to us. Mm -hmm. But their record is really really poor, especially exactly. in these two regions that we have highlighted. Yeah. yeah. So then the last thing in this region six is cleaning up our towns, and once again yeah. they touted things that were already in the pipelines or already created. Mm -hmm. So, like Steve was saying, Harmon kind of like had a whole rant about our, uh, our excerpt from the yeah. manifesto. Mm -hmm. So one of the things he says is um. I call this a plan for poverty for the Guyanese people. He can see ideas and programs which have already been put in place by this administration and so on. So this is the our uh, manifesto that was in the, this last yes. weekend's mirror. You guys can get a copy of this on our Facebook page yes, as well, well as the PP Facebook page. It's, it's widely circulated. circulated. If, if you need a copy, stop by at Freedom House and they'll be able to give you a copy. So what we want to go into today is going over it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of the big things for this manifesto, it's a manifesto for all Guyanese. We all want a society which is free, prosperous, socially just, globally be competitive, and which will serve every Guyanese equitably. Every Guyanese must have a chance for a good education, access good paying jobs, be able to start their own business, raise and provide for a family, own their own homes, live in a safe and secure environment, and retire with dignity. Every Guyanese must have full access to quality health care, safe water, be able to participate in sports and recreation, and freely practice their religion and culture. We believe our hard work and sacrifice bolstered by an economy strengthened by an oil and gas sector must guarantee the next generation of Guyanese a brighter and better future. So let's look at what the plans are for this. Yeah. Well, we'll start off with um, rescuing our productive sectors. We focus here tonight on Region 5 and 6. and as. Every guy is aware this is an agriculture heavy, um, re both are agriculture heavy region. So, um, in terms of the sugar industry, the PP is promising to reopen the sugar estates, re energize the local economy in the sugar communities. Uh, they are also promising to pursue productive diversification, provide retaining and uh, retraining and employment opportunities for workers establish transparent private sector partnerships in the sugar industry and lend support to private cane farmers, provide transitional support in areas where sugar estates were closed, work to solve the problem of the industry as a whole by forcibly bringing the industry to break even status and then to profitability by ensuring better management and greater efficiency through retooling, mechanization, product diversification, and private participation. Now, these were all things that the PP would have started prior to 2015. As you know, there was a world-class facility built at uh, Skeldon. Yes, there was some hiccups at the start, but those were already um, fixed. And in fact, in 2015, 2016, I recall that the coalition government boasting about how much um, uh, how much sugar ton um, per ton they, they mm -hmm. got there. And it was pointed out in Parliament that, you know, those canes were planted long before under the PP as a joke. But yes, the sugar industry was going very vibrant. It was taking that turn with the uh, modernization of these uh, plants and stuff a turn in the right direction to become competitive on the world market. However, as one pointed out earlier in the program, the coalition came in with a 
preconceived notion to close down the sugar estate. Mm-hmm. They didn't want it to hear anything from anyone. And so, not a COI. Well, that's what I'm getting at. No, they spent millions of our taxpayers' dollars on a COI. And the end of it, Granger said that, uh, oh, this is not gospel. I don't have to listen to this because mm-hmm. he, he did not get the answer he wanted mm-hmm. from the COI, which recommended zero closure yeah. of any estates. And they went ahead and closed the estate. Um, so moving on to the other areas, uh, forestry is also a big um, earner in Region 6. Uh, so the for those working in the forest industry can uh, enjoy reverse VAT on machinery equipment. As you know, there was zero VAT on machinery equipment prior to 2015, which the government then placed on those equipment. So if you're buying a chainsaw, now you have to pay the 14% VAT on it. That would be reversed immediately. Improve infrastructure, including the maintain, maintenance of primary road. We have seen and we have showed you constant pictures of the interior roads yes. and farm to market roads and how they have deteriorated under the coalition government, where huge trucks are sunk right into ditches and they can't move and it go, cares up the cost for everything. So um, those in the forestry industry knows about that and you can expect better primary roads. Um, Provide incentives for retooling and expanding the industry, which is very important in any sector, yes. to expansion and to diversify. Uh, promote the use of lesser known uh, species of wood. That You do that by the very next point, providing marketing support, including bilateral ag- arrangements, agreements to expand and create new markets. So uh, different countries would use different type of species. We here in Ghana would use our traditional species, but we have a vast yeah, rainforest at our, disposable, at our disposal. And by um, creating new opportunities and making bilateral I, arrangements, I, I think that, we can open um, up new markets. You know, PPP is basically saying <coughs> here that you know, we're going mm-hmm. to show the world the different types well, of wood and the different you know species yeah. that we have available mm-hmm. to the world market as you know as you're saying you know when the government gets involved in it you know it, it takes it at an, another level because you know they have the, the face-to-face communication with the leaders and the mm-hmm. businesses the business community and so on so mm-hmm. you know it really the forestry sector has a lot to look forward to because mm-hmm. once these new markets open yeah. you know our supply and our production can really well, expand mm-hmm. yeah, you especially. know and, it, and it's quite exciting for those in the industry once we have these new markets you exactly. know that are willing to pay mm-hmm. pay, pay uh, a good dollar a good thing too is that we'll, that we'll start market we'll give marketing support so for people doing hardwood or softwood and there's yeah. multiple types just like yes. i remember we had a, like a high school project a long time ago and it was more than four something samples of wood and mm-hmm. all I knew at that time was green heart and purple heart. <laughs> yeah, traditionally. <laughs> that's all, yes. Yeah, so then you were exposed to so many more and if we can market these for sale mm-hmm. into and other markets. We're talking about furniture. Exactly. You know, we're talking about a whole lot of different stuff that we can get our wood involved mm-hmm. in here. Uh, well, those in the mining sector, please don't feel left out. We have mm-hmm. uh, uh, plans for you guys as well. So in the mining sector, uh, the PPP has promised to work with miners and their organizations to remove obstacle to their development. Um, over the years, uh, from 2015 upwards, we've had a lot of complaints from the miners. Uh, many of them came to the office and what? would have spoken with the leader of the opposition mm-hmm. about um, their tax, their royalties going up, tributes tax going up, and all mm-hmm. these things. Um, placing VAT on their machinery equipment as well. So the very next um, that point that was and that was big. That yeah. was big, Rudy, because yeah. that that sent the price up a whole mm-hmm. lot for those miners. Well, a lot of them stop mining now too. Yes, yes exactly. indeed, yeah. we've heard so much. You know, a lot of people have left their dredges and, and came mm-hmm. away. Some people are renting their dredges. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. The mining sector is really has really taken a hit. In fact, the um, the only reason that we've seen a growth. Uh, a minimal growth in the sector was because of the two new uh, gold yes. mining companies that yeah, came that in, the large gold mining well. companies came in um, under the PPP. And they were the ones that they have gotten settled in, they started to mine. So when the coalition came in, the Minister of Finance would always boast, oh, but look, mining is doing well. <laughs> But, but it, the small and well. medium scale miners were suffering, and these are traditionally the Guyanese miners. So the PP is promising to re- reverse the VAT on machinery equipment and revert to the 2% royalty rate, which has been increased by this government. They are uh, to establish a fairer, more transparent system for allocating mining concessions with more equitable access for small miners, extend and upgrade roads in mining communities. I think Which? what you should, uh, mm-hmm. we should highlight here is the people getting most of these concessions right now have been cronies and they've been taking yeah, it away from yeah. small miners who've always traditionally worked that part. 
No. Those those blocks. Yeah, we've heard that the um, the minister who was there before, her family is heavily Bruce. engaged in mining, and her family now controls all the areas that has um, has been tested positive for a lot of gold deposits mm -hmm. and my um, diamond. Um, they're also promising to extend and upgrade roads in mining communities, something that which I just spoke about uh, in the forestry sector, same as in the mining sector. Protect the rights and improve conditions of service for workers in large mining companies. Accelerate the implementation of projects in the bauxite and non-traditional mining sectors. Provide training for miners through apprenticeship and education opportunities. Of course, it's always important to provide training for any workforce, regardless if you're working in Baghdad, you're working in an office. Training and educating yourself is something that would always enable them to be better able to do their trade and play their trade. Yes, and this is especially <coughs> good because young people who are, who are involved in mining, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, they can have training and education you know that, that, that can develop themselves and if so you look at the two you just mentioned they're going to move uh, accelerate the implementation of products in non-traditional mineral sectors mm -hmm. so if you're looking at it young mm -hmm. people are moving away from the traditional gold and diamonds mm -hmm. and they're looking more like amethyst and these things too so having education and teaching them more of these things too would exactly. help great stuff um, as we move rice. on to rice, so we are still dealing with our productive sectors here. Um, expanding existing markets and securing new ones for rice and paddy. Now, as we all know, as soon as the government came into office, they uh, tried to renegotiate with Venezuela the petro uh, arrangement that the PP had in place, and they were unsuccessful. Uh, we lost that market, which was a very lucrative market for the rice farmers, and rice has not been they, able to recover they, um, since as a result of this. They came in and the contract had a year left. Exactly. And they just... They couldn't renegotiate it, basically. Do you remember, what, what, they mm -hmm. remember what they had promised? Do you remember what they had promised? Yes, they came in on a lie promise in $9,000. $9, uh, uh, they, yeah. they got a song that is going to it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I won't sing it on this program, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you, know you promised 9000 a bag, you now you're getting power. You know, you're no, it, it, additionally, so they lost that market and the PP is promising to open up new markets. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, these are all proven in our track record for yeah. the, over the years because the petro that was something negotiated under the um, former president, um, Mr. Barry Jagdeo. And now, coming back into office, the PP can do these things again. They have done it before. It's nothing new that we're going to embark on. It's nothing strange to the PPP. These are all things that they have done before, they were doing which were destroyed by this coalition government, which they will bring back. Um, now, mind, this is just excerpts from our manifesto. The full and new better promises, uh, you will see the full more manifesto detailed. and more detail. You will find out more about these and how they intend to do these things. Uh, moving on, we, they would reverse the increase in land rents and drainage and irrigation charges. Um, you know that the MMA has been plaguing the farmers in Region 5 to raise their fees by some five, six hundred percent sometimes. And as I said earlier, this, this, this sector has been, has taken a, a tremendous hit. Uh, so much so that the business, uh, that the government response to this was that, oh, rice is private business. Oh. Uh, refusing to help rice farmers. Uh, something which the PP would have done over the years every time the sector is in problem. Uh, they also promised to remove VAT on machinery equipment, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, etc. that uh, everyone uses in this sector. Restore budgetary support for adequate provision and maintenance for drain and irrigation systems and farm to market roads. Uh, increase, increase productivity through research development into new strands and pest control. One of the things there actually mm -hmm. is before leaving uh, the government, the BP was already undertaking a project where they were looking at the paddy bug problem. Mm -hmm. They had recognized it and they started a study. I think it was some a few millions into it. The obviously, you know, when the massive firings mm -hmm. happen, so no one there was left. But there was the people who was actually doing the research, but no one to kind of guide them. Mm -hmm. So all the money just kind of went flat, and they just did not bother continuing this project. So these are things that were already there. Had the government continued on with it, maybe we wouldn't have had such a massive paddy bug problem. And as I said, um, the the year. coalition government view rice as private business, mm -hmm. and they want nothing to do with it or to help the farmers. Yeah. Uh, the PP is also promising in the sector to explore a price stabilization slash uh, revolving fund facility for farmers. So every time, uh, if 
you were to encounter problems, you can access this fund and, and be fund. able to get back on your feet. Not what is happening now. We have heard stories of uh, many rice farmers. That's they took it. loans, they bought new machineries, and then the industry is down, and now the bank is after them, and they can't even feed their children. A lot of them have stopped farming rice. They're trying to rent them. Exactly. Um, in other crops, the PP is promising to create a supporting environment for the other crops' development, including through incentives, drainage and irrigation, processing and marketing. They're also promising to promote agricultural diversification with focus on coconut, ethanol, aqua farms and horticulture. Promote an agri-energy industry producing bioethanol mm -hmm. through sugarcane, palm oil, cassava and That's corn. That's great. Uh -huh. Expand production of import substitute crops. Uh, expand soybean and other crops in the hinterland savannas, paying attention to fragile ecosystem and indigenous land rights. Now, this yes. was something already in the plan. We started off with the rice, and then it was going to expand into more and more areas. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, you know what happened there. Uh, provide training and financial support. Again, I'm always a strong advocate for education, regardless if you're a farmer or not. Being educated in what you do makes you better at what you do and yes. helps you to progress in your field. Uh, incentivize young people to pursue a career in agriculture and create training opportunities at tertiary level to support them. Yes, this is very important because I know a lot of young people that are actually very interested in agriculture mm -hmm. and they just didn't know how now, how to come and do it. Mm -hmm. Um, as it relates to cattle and livestock, uh, the PP is promising to provide a support system and small grant for livestock farmers, very important stuff, mm -hmm. provide concession in large-scale livestock farming, provide appropriate breeding stock training and facilities for cutting, packaging and storage of meat. So you could look forward to all of those if you are a livestock farmer. Additionally, you could um, look forward to incentivize private investment in dairy plants, dairy processing facilities, and the establishment of modern abattoirs facilities in livestock producing regions. So um, you don't have to take your livestock from one region all the way to another one. The PP is promising to um, put modern facilities in your region. Uh, minimize conflicts between livestock farmers and crop farmers through zoning, which, is, which I think is very important because as it stands yeah. right now, you always have problems with um, yeah, rice come, farmers come rice and, yeah, <laughs> and stuff like that. In the fishery sectors, the PP is promising to enhance support for fishermen and the co-op societies, reverse increases in licensing fees and taxes on fishing equipment, something that this government did. Uh, yeah. You guys, we have talked many times about the increase in 200 uh, plus new taxes and measures. Uh, this is one of them, and licensing fees, this is one of them. There was an increase in the fishing license and on the equipment and stuff. Promote the creation of markets for commercial fisher fisheries, including partnerships with investors who already have established markets. Um, this is very important as well. I think many fishermen uh, would be very excited about this because, as you know, we have lost a very lucrative market under this government. Uh, they would have gotten a year and a half notice that Ghana need to do certain upgrades in order to be able to continue to export catfish into the U.S., yes. which they failed completely to do, never did anything about it, and there is still a ban in place on exporting catfish mm -hmm. to the U.S. Which was one of their largest mm -hmm. exporters. Which right? is the largest exporter within this industry uh, to that market. So the PP is promising to get these things back on board. Um, provide concession for large-scale livestock farming. Ensuring that fishermen displaced by activities in the oil sector are compensated. I think that should be explained a little more. It's mm. talking about like oil spills. There's nothing right now mm -hmm. preventing f to help fishermen. In case there's an oil spill, mm -hmm. that's it. That whole area you can't fish. Mm -hmm. And there's no fund there just in case, let's say Steve was fishing out there and mm -hmm. he needs now the money for his children. There's nothing now. So if you're a fisherman, you're displaced as a result of anything happening within the oil sector, the PP is promising to compensate you. Um, additionally, provide incentives to develop aquaculture. Intensify anti-piracy efforts, including by utilizing GPS tracking system and drone monitoring, something that's desperately needed um, at this point in time. As one was mentioning earlier, just a few months ago, there was another piracy attack after 
we're not claiming to end piracy here. We're just putting things in place that will be able to help us to respond faster. Yeah, but we'll, we'll use those drones yes. that they bought. <laughs> and from everything that I'm seeing here, you know, there are a lot of incentives, a lot of concessions, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things that they're, they're doing yeah. to ensure that persons remain in these traditional sectors. And mm -hmm. I think that this is, these are the things that I'm very pleased about in the manifesto. Mm -hmm because it, it's not just putting all of the emphasis on, on oil and gas, which is the emerging, emerging mm -hmm. sector in our country, mm -hmm. but it's really propping up and making attractive, or if I can use the word sexy, the other <laughs> traditional uh, sectors to mm -hmm. ensure that persons remain there and they can actually earn a living yeah. and they can benefit, them mm -hmm. and their families can benefit from these areas. So you have the, the oil and gas sector, which will be lucrative, mm -hmm. but you also make it available, the other traditional sectors, so the two are linked, yes. so yeah. that you know you have a balance in the country, and, exactly. and it's, it's not um, putting all your eggs, as, as they say, in one basket. And we don't fall prey to the Dutch disease, the Dutch yes. which is exactly. what this government is pushing exactly. us towards. But, but ensure that our productive sectors, mm -hmm. they continue Stay to be productive. vibrant, mm -hmm. and you know, they, they're vibrant and they're, they're productive, even as our oil and gas sector mm -hmm. uh, takes, uh, takes off. Uh, but in this before sense. Nalini get into the oil and gas, sector, I think one you um, wanted to yeah. look at the infrastructure side of things. Oh yes, uh, we, we can deal yeah. with the uh, oil and gas mm -hmm. in a few. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, Ghana's infrastructure, including the infrastructure for transport, this is overland road, uh, air and river, the utilities, which are the water, telecoms, ICT, electricity, uh, sea and river defense, drainage, garbage collection, sanitation, new hospitals and schools must be expanded, uh, modernized, and become more efficient to support a flourishing economy. And this is the right that the PPP has. So the following are some of the measures uh, which the PPP will implement. Uh, they have vowed to expand main roads and other essential infrastructure to accommodate growth in pop population and traffic. And we, we see now the, the, the traffic situation in yes. our country. It's becoming, <laughs> it's becoming very, very... The drive up here. <laughs> yes, it's becoming very, very <laughs> difficult, I would say. You know, so we have a growing population economy. You know, we, mm -hmm. have, to, we have to ensure we have more roads. And uh, we've done this before. Like yes, I mentioned, the of, roads of, are earlier. Of course, so of course. <laughs> you, know, you know, some people might say, you know, roads are something that you have to continuously build and upgrade mm -hmm. and, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, but, you know, there's strategic roads that you also have to build to ensure that the business community and, and the enterprise is able to function well. Exactly. And the PP is also promising to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing here also improve community roads and implement an urban improvement program in Georgetown and other urban areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so that urban development will be part of the PPP's mm -hmm. agenda in the next government. Uh, they're also planning to promote better drainage to prevent flooding in our communities, enhancing the drainage and irrigation systems. Uh, to improve agricultural productivity and community health and welfare. Uh, there is also, they're also promising to provide significant support from central government for garbage collection in our communities. And we see that this is a problem, especially uh, in, in regions five and six. I'm, I'm aware that sometimes they don't get their, their garbage collected because of, of issues with the, <laughs> with the council and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Central government sometimes have to uh, you know, lend their support in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing here ensuring regular maintenance of outfall channels and sluices and procure suitable dredging equipment for each affected region. Mm -hmm. Good news. Uh, they're promising also to build a bypass road. This might interest you guys. Build a by bypass road with connections to Maka, Eccles, and the Demerara Harbor Bridge. Mm -hmm. So we'll have yes. a Something bypass that road. definitely needed <laughs> on this right point. Now, yeah. So we can, we can escape mm -hmm. some of the traffic sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, they're promising to build and maintain about 2,000 miles of our hinterland roads, mm -hmm. which is very important as well. And maintaining hinterland airstrips and develop let them to international port of entry status. Mm -hmm. Now I just mentioned the business opportunities and why you have to create roads and so on and so forth. You know, development of this, this airstrip uh, will you know, really allow for commercialism to come alive more in Latem. Yeah. And this is what we need. We need like a business shock in this, in this country mm -hmm. because Guyana right now is not performing the way that it's supposed to be performing. You know, we have so many job Not on track to perform. Yes, exactly. We have so much job losses. We have so many businesses that are, that are overtaxed. We have businesses that are not pr uh, producing the way that they once produced before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really need to ensure that we have the infrastructure in place. And, and this is one of the things that DPP is promising to do. Also, I'm seeing here expanding river transport and improved ferry services. And of course, uh, the PPP has had uh, its record where it has uh, continuously built new schools and hospitals. But this time around, and, and I think even before, they're outfitting it with modern equipment. Mm -hmm. and they're vowing to do that, ensuring that our healthcare standards are, are improved. 
or uh, modernizing as yes. modern things came around too, right? <laughs> yes. They've been there since 92. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So even in addition to these measures, the PPC government will initiate work on several transformative infra infrastructural projects. And these are what I would like to call the flagship mm -hmm. uh, projects. projects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, we will have a deep water harbor at the Burbies estuary. Uh, they're also promising to construct the Linden to Letham Road, mm -hmm. uh, a four-lane highway from Georgetown to Tumiri, uh, the Perica to Rockstone, Del Conte Road, and link with Bartica. And mm -hmm. this will be very important, especially to our tourism sector, mm -hmm. which PPP is mm -hmm. planning to reintroduce. They, do, yeah, they exactly. do plan on putting back in, in a Ministry of Tourism. Mm -hmm. yes. that, that, that's good news. <laughs> yeah, you know, they had destroyed yeah. it, made it into the Minister Department of Business. Uh, yeah, made the Minister of Business in charge of it. But tourism is so important to Guyana that we have to really exploit uh, the, the opportunities that tourism presents. You know, mm -hmm. This, 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 this country expanding. is so beautiful. So yeah. Exactly. It's, it's so mm -hmm. beautiful and we have so many different species of animals and flowers. Flora, we have to flora, ensure that we have here our country right there in, in, the tourism, in the tourism sector. Another uh, flagship project is the bridge to the Quarantine River, a high span bridge across the Demerara River, and of course, they're promising to implement duty-free zones. Very important. So, um, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> very, very important. So these are some of the infrastructural projects that they're looking to push ahead with. A lot of it, uh, Guyanese and our viewers, you pro guys will probably have heard about these already because it's nothing I would say new the PPP has been saying that they will do most of these projects uh, in the past. Another key element or another key project that is upcoming under PPP government would be the Amila Falls Hydro Project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not something which just started here. already and yes. was disbanded yes, because was of this disbanded. This is something they fought against and mm -hmm. it would have been online, what, last year? Since last year, yes. yes. Since so last year. It's saying here that energy is key for the economic growth of Ghana and for an improved quality of life for all Guyanese. The PVPC is committed to providing affordable, stable and reliable energy to benefit both households and businesses. Uh, we will implement a program with an energy mix that includes hydropower, solar and wind which will lead to more than 400 megawatts of newly installed capacity for residential and commercial industry. Now, GPL earlier this year, they had uh, reported that they were experiencing a current shortfall of 23 megawatts of power. Mm -hmm. So we're having uh, the introduction, PP is pledging about 400 megawatts to add to the capacity on the system. Yes. A matter of fact, um, under this government, GPL, between Ju June 1st and August 1st, 2019, uh, they had reported that there were 772 blackouts. Wow. wow. <laughs> For those who are connected to the Demerara and Burby's interconnected system, 772 blackouts. Wow. So this Amelia Falls Hydro project, you know, is really moving towards clean, reliable, and affordable power supply. Uh, it will also produce an excess of 200 megawatts in the interim from natural gas. Uh, you know, PVP is also promising to invest in solar and wind systems, and these are for the off-grid areas. As well, they're promising to expand on the hinterland electrification program, where they were <coughs> supplying solar panels to the, the indigenous communities mm -hmm. to ensure that they had stable electricity. Um, they're also uh, promising to replace and upgrade the solar panels in the hinterland uh, and take urgent action to improve and upgrade the national grid which is the transmission and distribution so they're basically pledging to increase capacity of GPL to ensure that it has stable power to mm -hmm. to basically provide electricity to the entire country and, and uh, as I mentioned before uh, this government <laughs> with what the, how they're managing GPL mm -hmm. it's as if every day we're having we're having blackouts in our country and I don't think it's ever been this bad uh, mm -hmm. post I would say 1992 exactly <laughs> and in fact um, GPL is practically bankrupt now under this administration yes, mm -hmm. right. isn't there a contract for fuel up in December? Uh, uh, interesting you brought it up. The, um, the, our current suppliers heavy fuel would have indicated to us that uh, as of December they will be no longer supplying us and the government had uh, a while of notice to get this on board. Um, however, they only put out the bid a couple days ago. So, so let's, see um, what let's hope that they find a supplier urgently or the entire country will be faced with blackout until we can find a supplier. Oh. But this is what I've been talking about earlier, about the negligence of this government, the way they do things, unbothered, basically, well, yeah, about that's anything. Your, that's your uh, 
go to the go to yeah. yeah. well, the last yeah. thing here we have seen is that, that they're promising to develop microgrids for large in uh, the hinterland villages. Mm. So not just the coast, we're not so focusing exactly. on the coast it's from the country as well. It's Micro a manifesto for all. Mm -hmm. And correct. one of the big things in the manifesto people would expect would be the oil and gas, but it's actually not a very large uh, portion of it. Yeah, the, the more technical part of this will come along in the actual manifesto, yes. which will be launched so in January. <laughs> we will approach the oil and gas sector in a national, non-partisan manner. Oil and gas will not only bring significant financial resources and enormous transformational opportunities, but also many challenges. There are many examples around the world where developing countries have experienced a windfall from oil and gas, but eventually po end up poorer than before. Mm -hmm. Central to our strategy in the sector will be in three um, critical areas to ensure that our oil resources manage uh, more responsibly. So I'm going to go through what the people plan on doing that to ensure we don't fall prey to, like Steve I likes to say, the Dutch disease. So immediately engage the oil and gas company in a better contract and administration. Uh, for so we're going to negotiation, which Trotman has now admitted that. It wasn't yes. they could have done a better deal, they right? So finally, we finally yes. got some honesty out of it. What the PDP was saying all along is exactly. that we, we needed to get a better deal. What they but were uh, we all were all crazy and now uh, disagreeing <laughs> with us. Uh, establish an arms length sovereign wealth fund insulated from political interference. Define legislation on how the funds will flow from the sovereign wealth fund into the budget and what purpose they will be used. So, so Nalini, just let me talk a little bit on this, um, okay. and you know, and how we're we going to get the sovereign wealth fund out of political interference. Well, it's by so following the Santiago principles of transparency. Correct. So, I think right now the minister has a lot of control yes. over the sovereign wealth fund and how a lot of it happens. You know, the committees and so on and so forth. So, what the PPP is 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 pledging to do in its manifesto and. Viewers will be very interested to know about this because, you know, they might say, you know, they don't want politicians to have their hands directly involved in the mm -hmm. sovereign wealth fund yes. because Definitely. of the temptation and everything that can mm -hmm. happen, corruption, mm -hmm. manipulation, you know, and, and all the rest of it. So the PPP is going to have a technical team uh, that would manage the sovereign wealth fund, mm -hmm. right? And they'll have a uh, 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 hands-off approach to the mm -hmm. sovereign wealth fund. You know, of course, they would have to, the parliament will have to be involved in it and all the rest of it. So. It would, it would have to be systematic in how the monies are spent from the Sovereign Wealth Fund. It wouldn't just be, you well, know, the minister deciding well, one day he wants to buy an aircraft mm, and, and yes. then or an well, airplane and, and that's it. That is literally what is defined in the Santiago Principles, is yeah. governing bodies will be appointed in a predetermined manner. They will have to act in the best interest. There will yes. be clear defined drawdowns of how the money will be used and yes. so on. So um, ensuring that expenditures are transparent and determination to go through a parliamentary process will be an equal discussion yes. at parliament. So one of the things is to establish a regulatory framework which is independent of politicians. And at his last press conference, the general secretary did mention that mm -hmm. politicians could go to jail for Yes. Failure to disclose yes. uh, uh, monies, which yeah. this government actually did. One year and plus, they were yeah. withholding the fact that they received the uh, millions yes. of dollars yeah. from 18. the um, The <coughs> fiction of our imagination of mm -hmm. Jordan, right? Yes. Build a strong national capacity, capability to hold oil com companies accountable and to verify production or their expenditures. Because right now, we have to tell the oil company we're coming to go see there how many barrels they we have. We have to so give them a two months notice yes. before we could even um, mm -hmm. set foot on that ship. Exactly. So it's like you're renting your house and you have to tell the man, um, I'm coming to see it, so please clean up. Um, <laughs> wait two months and then you can come. Yeah. So another thing is to ensure the blocks are competitively tendered and auctioned so we won't have deals like Tolo being 1% better than what... Uh, well, it's 0% royalty the because it's yeah. recoverable. Yeah. So. Exactly. <laughs> Establish a model of a product sharing agreement based on industry-wide standards and best practices. The purpose of this is to ensure the Guyanese receive maximum benefit from these contracts without the sense of the foreign investors. Yeah. Uh, train thousands of Guyanese to uh, work in the sector. So to prevent the oil money from being squandered, the PPP will sign on to the Santiago Principles. The Santiago Principles are 24 guidelines that uh, came up from around the world. Uh, 30 um, countries are there. 80% of the assets will be managed by the sovereign um, fund. And then they also, we've, in 2010, we signed the um, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Initiative. So we're 
already a part of that. That actually, the data uh, data collection for the first report from this is still ongoing, mm -hmm. when we should have had it. Yes. Um, the Santiago principles have very clear rules, so uh, independence and annual reporting, independent auditors. So we're being signaled by our, um, by our operator there yeah. that we are running out of time, so I'll just quickly finish this mm -hmm. part of it and we'll come back to this next week. Mm -hmm. Is there'll be, a cr like we mentioned, criminalization for non-disclosure of receipt of funds from oil revenues. Ensure annual reports from the government are laid at the National Assembly detailing oil revenues expenditures. So we'll have a few annual reports. Mm -hmm. The fund, the one from the ETI, and then the government. Mm -hmm. Ensure there are regular audits by independent auditors is something the Santiago principles demand. Mm -hmm. And civil society will be involved in a central role to monitor complacence and accountability, compliance and accountability. Sorry. Definitely. So, um, guys. Next week we will continue on the last bit in the oil sector mm -hmm. and uh, wrap up. So, um, as we mentioned, the, this is just excerpt from the manifesto. It is titled Our Plan for Prosperity. It's a, yes. it's a very interesting document. Uh, uh, you can get a copy of this on our, on our Facebook page, on the People's Progressive Party Facebook page, uh, on the Mero Facebook page, uh, and generally it's um, been circulated widely. Visit Freedom House. If you want a physical copy of it, you can visit Freedom House. It's free of charge. You don't have to pay anything for it. It's free. You can also visit the Office of the Leader of the Opposition and pick up a copy, and you you can look through all of these. As the week continue, we will be going and talking more about it. We barely scratch the surface as, as it relates to this document here. Um, uh, at this point in time, I'd just like to say uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for continuing to watch the program. Yes, we'll see you, next, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for <laughs> spending the last half hour with us. Please remember if you want to rewatch the program or share with a friend, it's on our Facebook page this week in 60 minutes. And don't forget to pick up your copy of the mirror this week. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Have a good, good night. night.